All right, well, um, uh, my name is Justin Perryman and I am uh, an attorney. I have uh, been in private practice uh, since 1995, so coming up on uh, 25 years. And I'm also a, uh, a judge advocate for the United States Army. And that, uh, that's an attorney for the Army. And people often ask, what does a, a, a lawyer do in the Army? And what I tell people is uh, think about the army as a big corporation that has a, a million employees mm -hmm. with offices uh, in virtually every country in the planet. It buys and it sells and it conducts uh, lots of movements and contracts. It's got people everywhere. Occasionally those people do good things, occasionally uh, poor things, but it also has some very unique missions. And uh, one of those is uh, in, in my, my field of, of expertise is uh, operating on what we call the DODEN, the Defense Department of Defense Information Network. And uh, what that is, if you, uh, Tim, you probably know this being an educator, but the, uh, the internet was a, uh, was a creation of the Department of Defense and uh, through a, a group called uh, DARPA, which created a means by which they could send diffused information, packets of information from essentially uh, the Washington DC capital region to Cheyenne Mountain. And this is all open source information, none of it's uh, uh, secret information. And so they uh, created a, a means by which they could send information. And if uh, one of the landlines were attacked by the, uh, then the Soviets, or if there was a breach in the telecommunications, they would be able to communicate and essentially uh, defend the country by launching our uh, ICBMs, uh, attacking those who are uh, attacking us. And so the internet was uh, designed to essentially transmit data in a secure way through multiple means. And um, it uh, of course has uh, migrated quite a bit uh, since then, it's now more of a commercial application, but the Department of Defense still operates a decent portion of of the internet on, uh, we use uh, CenturyLink, they're our primary commercial carrier. And we have what's, as I had stated, what's called the Department of Defense Information Network. And so as an attorney for the United States Army, um, I work with uh, our partners in the military, whether it be the Air Force or the, uh, the Navy, the Marine Corps, now even Space Force, even though I've never met a Space Force person or don't even know what to call them. But uh, I know this is their symbol, you know, right there. But uh, nonetheless, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we, we partner with them to, to essentially enable the Department of Defense to communicate effectively through uh, the internet. And that's our defense uh, network. And uh, we have the benefit of having uh, satellites and ground stations and our own wiring and uh, our own uh, uh, networks that are both uh, internal to our systems and then pass through external systems uh, that will hit the commercial internet. And so it's a, it's a very interesting and dynamic area of the law. I feel very fortunate at my age uh, to, uh, you know, been introduced, uh, you know, to cyber law in the military. Uh, they try to enable the younger uh, judge advocates or lawyers, you know, to get access to kind of the newer technologies, but occasionally they do need uh, some older people. And uh, in the military, I'm considered old, believe it or not. At age uh, 52, I'm one of the older guys. So, uh, at some point, it's harder to uh, to run and do push-ups and sit-ups, so kind of weeds out uh, the older older people. And uh, they were very nice in letting me learn about uh, machine learning and cloud computing, and uh, artificial intelligence, and some of just the real neat whiz bang stuff you know that are out there, the uh, GIS uh, systems, which is the geospatial, and uh, we've done a lot with uh, the surveillance systems, which we're now putting on aerial. Uh, unmanned systems. And, uh, you know, that's been a, a great area for me. So for the last two years, I've been at Scott Air Force Base, uh, not too far from St. Louis, and working in the legal office there, and uh, working with other cyber attorneys uh, around the country to uh, really to codify and develop our uh, nation's uh, cyber laws from a, a government perspective. So um, in my private practice, I'm a, a small business lawyer, and my offices, uh, when they were open, were down at Cortex, 
and that's where I first got uh, involved with uh, this this group uh, starting about four years ago. And uh, I don't mind saying that the uh, the pizza and the beer were uh, were enticing, you know, and uh, hopefully we will go back to that. And uh, I look forward to uh, to meeting you all in person someday. So that uh, that kind of brings me to my discussion today. Uh, before we get started, do I have uh, any questions about my uh, my biography or who I am or need further uh, introduction? All right. So what I thought I would talk about today is kind of the major themes of cyber law. And, and keep in mind, cyber law is a is a new field. It's uh, popping up at the uh, major law schools and popping up at a lot of the uh, university. Uh, Tim Jacks, uh, you can probably testify that that uh, cyber programs are, are a real hot item. But if you look back five years ago, there weren't many schools that really had a great deal, and certainly very few in the, in the legal community. Washington University Law School, where I'm an adjunct professor, is considering uh, some programs there in the cyber realm. I've, I've spoken to uh, them about starting with maybe a weekend course and then advancing to uh, maybe something uh, a little bit more formal. But it's, a, it's an area that's quickly developing. And so what you find is there, there are a lot of people that hold themselves out as cyber law experts or, or people in the know when it comes to cyber law. And I always uh, find that interesting because their backgrounds are, are sometimes limited to solely commercial, the commercial enterprises. So in other words, if somebody tells you that, uh, you know, I'm in academia and I'm a cyber law expert, but I've never worked with government, then they're gonna be limited in what they can, uh, they can actually advise because the government controls so much of the cyber realm. And most, uh, if not all of the enforcement of uh, the cyber realm is through governmental agencies and uh, typically uh, law enforcement, such as the FBI. So I wanted to kind of break down the major themes uh, in, into three areas. Uh, the first is state versus federal regulations. So as of right now, there are no municipal uh, ordinances. So in, in the city of St. Louis or in any of the cities that we reside, there are municipal ordinances. You can't play your music too loud. You've got to wear uh, a face mask in public. Uh, there's parking, but they don't have that for the most part in, in cyber. Um, it's relegated almost exclusively to states and then the federal government. And the states are relatively new players in the cyber uh, regulation uh, field. And that's just coming um, in the last two or three years. So they are, like I said, it's, most states are developing their cyber laws. And we're going to talk about some of the, uh, the movements uh, and trends in cyber law on the state level. But the federal government has been operating in this realm for about um, about 20 years. And uh, we'll talk about some of the first re uh, legislation and how it's uh, developed. And then I'll even talk about some of the international regulations that are applicable here in the United States and uh, will touch our lives. The second major theme is the private sector versus governmental agency regulations. In other words, there are laws that apply to the government and there are laws that uh, apply to the private sector. So when somebody asks me, what are some of the primary uh, regulations for cyber law? What I'll tell them is, the first thing I will ask is, well, who is the, uh, the person who, who's asking? In other words, are you asking on behalf of the government or are you asking on behalf of a private individual or a business? And, and I'll give you an example. As a governmental agency, you are prohibited from what's called offensive cyber operations. And what offensive cyber for operations would be is a governmental agency. Let's just say it's uh, the United States Army, or let's talk about uh, the Department of Energy, taking upon themselves, you know, utilizing their IT professionals or some of their hackers to go and conduct an operation that would have a potentially negative effect on an adversary. So me in the Army, I can't get on uh, my computer and go and try to do something malicious or even what I would determine as defensive against, let's just say, the, the Russian government. Because it could have very it could have long lasting and, and very important implications for the, the whole of government. And so you wouldn't want a an individual in at uh, the Army Corps of Engineers deciding that they're going to take on the Russian government. That would not be a good thing for us. And so there are certain laws that apply to governmental agencies that don't apply to individuals. There are also laws that apply to businesses that will not apply to 
uh, governmental agencies. And one of those, uh, for example, is data privacy. So there are certain laws that will apply to businesses that we'll talk about that will not are not applicable to governmental agencies. And the third major theme is privacy protection versus breach response. In other words, when I go to consult and advise a, a, a company or a, an individual or even a governmental agency in my capacity in the military, what I tell them is, is that we have certain responsibilities to protect data that we are entrusted with. And in the event of a breach, there we have certain responsibilities to mitigate that, that breach. And so these are the three major things. Again, state versus federal regulations, private sector versus governmental agency regulations, and privacy protections versus uh, breach responsibility. So let me get into the, uh, start with the, uh, the federal regulations. So the primary uh, law that I work under as, a, uh, as an attorney and a consultant is the uh, Federal Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And that's uh, commonly known as the CFAA. And uh, if you know anything about law, almost everything is annotated in what's called the United States Code. So this is uh, 18 USC, which stands for United States Code, section 1030. So what you'll often hear is when someone says that's a 1030 violation, what that means is that they're referring to the US Code. And that 1030 violation is the basic foundation of cyber uh, laws here in the United States. And some of the things that I annotated uh, were that section 1030, which is the primary regulatory authority for prosecuting cyber crimes. So the law applies to both hacker, who hackers who gain access to victims' computers without authorization, without being authorized. And so it is a, a United States law. It's a punishable um, by the Department of Justice through uh, some of its various actors. But the basics of the law is, is that you can access your own network and basically do anything you want on your network, provided that your actions don't affect others. And equally important, you cannot access without permission somebody else's network. So think about it you know, in, in this way. I, I always kind of like to dumb things down. We can do a lot of things in our house. You know, you can go into your house, you can kind of scream and yell. Your, uh, your house can kind of look like a uh, Robert's uh, office there. Robert, I'm sorry about that, but kind of look like Robert's room in there. And, it's my living room. <laughs> and nobody but Robert's uh, family is, are really gonna say anything. Um, but if you start cooking meth in your home, we've all seen Breaking Bad, um, then you can get yourself in some trouble. So there are limits of what you can do inside your house. Can't uh, be, uh, you can't strike a family member. Obviously, you can't break some laws, but uh, for the most part, you have a lot of uh, authority within your house. What you don't have the ability to do is to go into somebody else's property, into their home, without their permission. When you do that, you are essentially uh, either trespassing or breaking and entering. And uh, of course, there's a number of additional laws that you're violating as well. And it's the same in kind of the the cyber realm. And that is that you're, you can access your computer, you can access your network, but you can't go without permission and access someone else's, um, their computer and their network. The way I look at it is, I remember when I was a youngster and uh, I know that my mom used to keep candies in her purse. And um, you know, I'm sure a lot of people had a mother like that, that when you were good or you were crying or you were in pain, your mom would reach into uh, her purse and she'd pull out this little hard candy and, and hand it to you but you were not permitted to stick your hand inside her purse. And you certainly weren't permitted to take her purse and dump it out on the table. Now I know that because I did that once and I can tell you that was a bad day. Yes, what not I a pretty good is, that's right. <laughs> and what I learned was the unauthorized access to my mom's purse is the equivalent of violating a federal law. Ooh. And so I was, taught at a very young age to be careful of unauthorized access. And so the Federal Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the CFAA, is that foundational law that essentially says you cannot go into somebody else's network or onto their computer, and now even onto their, uh, their personal device, you know, such as a, their smartphone, and access their network, even if you do it without the intention of, of harming them. So. It's a, it's, a, it's a very good foundational law, and it's used to prosecute for cyber extortion, 
the trafficking of passwords, the damage to computer networks or, or DDoS or malware, any intent to defraud through like phishing, uh, access, wrongful access to government computers. Um, it applies to anything involved in interstate commerce or anything to do with uh, national security. So it's a very broad and sweeping uh, piece of legislation. And there was a, a recent uh, Supreme Court case called Van Buren versus the United States. And it's uh, before the Supreme Court, it's still pending. And uh, the, the issue in this case is whether a person who is authorized to access information on a computer for certain purposes can violate section 1030 of the Computer Fraud Act if he or she accesses the same information for an improper purpose. And, and I'll give you an example. Your neighbor says, uh, hey, while I'm gone, would you go into my house and feed my, my cats? And um, you say, absolutely, I'll be happy to. And they give you a key to their house and your job is to go into the, the house every day and feed the cats. I think we've all either done that or certainly known somebody who has. But while you're inside the house, you decide to rummage through their personal effects. Ooh. And you decide you're gonna start putting on some of their clothes and maybe playing with their, their video games and uh, maybe taking some of their food or playing pool and, uh, and just basically making yourself uh, at home in their, home, in their house. Now, the reality is that you had permission to go into the home. So you're not breaking or entering, you're not trespassing, but what you have done is you've exceeded your license, you've exceeded your permission. And so this Van Buren versus the United States is a case in which the, the United States government is prosecuting an individual who had authority to access a network, but then exceeded that authority. And Ooh. so it's an, ex, it's an expansion of the law. And I think we can all probably appreciate the fact that if uh, somebody is, uh, you know, you call up Microsoft or you call up a uh, software vendor and they, they mirror the computers, and they're assisting you through an installation, if they were to go onto your computer and uh, to take a look at your personal photographs or you know, download some of your financial data, that would be an, uh, a violation of this law because they're exceeding their authority or the permissions that you've granted them. The next law is the Electronic Communication Protection Act or known as the ECPA. And this is a, a law that protects the actual the communication, whether it's storage or transit. So the first law, like I said, is about accessing the network. The second law, the ECPA, is a, a law. And by the way, Tim, um, I know you're taking notes. I can probably see you doing that, but I'll be happy to, to send you uh, my, my notes as well, which kind of outline all this. So uh, awesome. feel free to, to, to enjoy without taking notes. I mean, yeah. Of course, you're it's, welcome to do whatever you like. I keep my mind engaged, so it's yeah, all good. Yeah, of course. <laughs> But uh, I'll be happy to, to, to provide anyone who is interested, um, you know, what, I, what I'm reading off of, so uh, for your, your edification. But the Electronic Communication Protection Act is, uh, is essentially a law that says once you kind of press the button to send a communication or you get on a, a phone or you get on a radio network or any type of communication device, then it can't be intercepted without your permission. Or in the case of the government, we aren't permitted when I say we, I, I consider myself an instrument of the, the government as an advisor for the United States Army and Department of Defense. We are permitted to, interf uh, to interface or interfere with your, your communication. And when I say interface, what uh, often happens is, is that we, uh, we intercept by, uh, by creating a, a shadow person on the other side, essentially an entrapment to get you to send us information that you normally would not do. And so that's prohibited under the Electronic Communication Protection Act. It, within that uh, act is the Stored Communication Act. And this is a, uh, an act that basically says that uh, you can't go in and uh, steal things from somebody's hard drive or from their memory, or, or now um, we primarily use uh, the cloud computing. So you can't access cloud computing or somebody's memory to withdraw information. And then uh, finally, the Wiretap Act. And this is the criminalizes the intentional interception of electronic communications. So uh, as, uh, as we all know from watching uh, you know, the police movies, if you get a wiretap, you, uh, you have to get permission from a judge through a means of a warrant. And uh, once you have that warrant, then you can go and you can tap somebody's phone, or in this case, you could tap their electronic communications. 
So these are the uh, two primary uh, pieces of legislation that have been around for a while that essentially protect uh, us from government interference and also protect us from individuals who would do us harm in the electronic realm. The 2002 Homeland Security Act was a, an act in response to 9-11. And uh, not only did it in, uh, uh, form, uh, formalize the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, but it also created a, a number of agencies, including some of the cyber protection agencies. And uh, coming out of that act was the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency Act, or the and the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agent. I'm sorry, the Cybersecurity Inf Infrastructure Security Act, which is more commonly known as CISA. And uh, CISA is now an organization that is basically the uh, the front office or or the public facing office or agency for the Department of Homeland Security dealing with uh, cyber crimes and cyber information and anything to do with cybersecurity. So that was a very important act, the 2002 Homeland Security Act, which resulted in the formation of CISA. The Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act, also known as CISA, could get a little bit confusing, is a law by the federal government, which basically says that if the Department of Defense or the NSA or the FBI or Department of Homeland Security or any government agency develops some intel which would benefit individuals or businesses that they can lawfully share that with those individuals. And so if you become a partner with CISA or you go onto their website or you receive their emails, they will often send you breaches, security breaches. So a few months ago, there was uh, some vulnerabilities identified in the Microsoft network, uh, Microsoft platform and CISA was uh, instrumental in making sure that uh, hospitals and universities and businesses and critical infrastructure were informed about these vulnerabilities. And there was a patch that Microsoft put out and everyone was encouraged to patch their computers immediately. And uh, some were able to do that, some weren't, but it enabled uh, essentially a protection, a virus protection against some malicious actors who had found this vulnerability inside uh, Microsoft's uh, software and were conducting uh, malicious uh, cyber inc incursion and, uh, and harming both people and, and agencies. So it was uh, quite an important thing and, and that's authorized under this Cyber uh, Sharing Act. The Federal Information Security Modernization Act of 2014, FIMSA. This is a, um, another law which essentially codifies the Department of Homeland Security's authority to implement informational security policies for non-national security federal executive branch systems including uh, technical assistance and deploying technologies for such systems. So what that basically means is, is that Department of Homeland Security can help essentially uh, municipalities and state agencies and government that doesn't have an, a very robust IT department or wouldn't have access to FBI or NSA uh, information when it comes to security breaches or DDoS. And uh, it's, a, it's a great law that essentially provides support to um, smaller agencies that can trickle down to businesses and, and the consumer. And it created what's called the United States Computer Emergency Readiness Teams. This is called US CERT. And uh, what these agencies are, are uh, essentially a uh, apparatus by which non-federal non government agencies can access the abilities of some of the, uh, the astute cyber uh, uh, agencies such as the NSA or the Department of Defense in, de in de protecting their uh, municipal systems or water systems or trash systems. So this is a, a very important law. Another important uh, organization is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. And so probably uh, most of you have heard if you're in, in uh, the cyber realm that there's something in the NIST cybersecurity framework and it's becoming in more and more important and what this is, is it's a series of special publications. They're, it's called the 800 series publications. And they're for designing uh, systems within your business or in your agencies or your organizations that will create good cyber hygiene and also response practices for in the event that you do have a DDoS or an incursion. And so uh, there's a number of them. 
800-160 is the system security engineering. 800-171 is protecting controlled unclassified information in non-federal systems. 861 is the computer security incident handling guide. So these are uh, these are really good uh, programs that have not been made mandatory for most businesses. They are for uh, for critical infrastructure businesses. So in the event that you want to uh, have a nuclear power plant, so you're like Ameren, which has operates a nuclear power plant. Uh, I believe I know in Missouri and I think in Illinois as well, they have to follow a lot of regulations. And uh, one of the regulations that they have to follow are the NIST regulations when it comes to cybersecurity. And the point of that is, is to protect the nuclear infrastructure from, from harming us. So a, as we know, there are a number of ways that a critical infrastructure can be attacked, but a lot of it comes from uh, just basically poor practices, business practices. And this provides guidelines on how to, uh, to manage that. For those of you who are interested in uh, contracting with the United States government, we have uh, the Federal Acquisition Regulation or the FAR. If you're contracting with the Department of Defense, you have what's called the DFAR, the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation. And under the FAR, there's a section of 52.204-21, which provides 15 measures to protect your, your, uh, your systems. So if you wanna do business with the United States government, you've gotta take these 15 measures. And uh, many of them are, are simple things like password protection, uh, dual authentication for accessing uh, your email or accessing your network. And um, another uh, area is, you know, what happens in the event that you do have, you know, a cyber incursion. And uh, one of the measures is, is having protocols for cyber response. So these provide for adequate, adequate security as well as incident reporting. Uh, another area of uh, cyber uh, legislation is uh, HIPAA. We all know the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. It was enacted in 1996, and it basically was a, a law that was designed to protect our healthcare information. Well, as uh, businesses and agencies started putting our healthcare information on computer networks, there became a cyber uh, crime uh, legislation within HIPAA which basically says that if you have uh, HPA health, uh, uh, personal, I'm sorry, PHA, PHI, personal health information, that you must take extraordinary uh, steps to protect that PHI from individuals who may try to access networks and then use that either sell on the dark web or use for whatever nefarious purposes. The 1999 Graham Leach uh, Biley Act is a, a law which basically protects our financial institutions. So this is a, a law that was uh, re, uh, designed originally um, to protect financial institutions, but as uh, information technology started to take over Wall Street and uh, the trading systems, it had a, uh, an amendment which uh, requires cybersecurity measures be taken for the protection of, uh, of individuals' information and financial information. And then under, uh, we talked about under uh, 18 U.S.C. 1030, there are a number of new laws that have been designed to protect us. Um, there's the identity theft laws, the aggravated identity theft laws, the access device fraud laws, the wire fraud laws, communication interference. These are all relatively new legislations that fall under that section 1030. All right, so those are kind of the... Uh, a quick rundown of the primary federal laws that are important if you're acting within the cyber realm. And what they come down to is, is guidance for us to have good cyber practices and then re a, a, a framework for responding in the event of a cyber incident. Under the uh, state cybersecurity regulations, every state, uh, there are now, I was told, 47 states that have enacted uh, cybersecurity uh, legislation. I would imagine the other three are, are catching up very shortly or may have already done so. But the leaders in this area are the state of California and New York. And uh, as one can imagine, these are two big economies. They're uh, economies that, that have not just uh, importance to our country, but also have critical importance because of what they, they represent. In California, it's the hub of our technology industry. And subsequently, it is a leader in uh, data privacy. So a, a new law was uh, passed in 2018. 
it actually uh, some of the more um, areas, stringent areas were just uh, the the law applied. It started on January 1st of this year. So we're, we're talking 33 days ago. So while the law was enacted two years ago, it's kind of getting implemented now. And that's the California Consumer Privacy Act, the CCPA. And this is probably the most important piece of state legislation when it comes to uh, cybersecurity. And what it does is it allow it enables California businesses and individuals or people doing business in California or people who desire to do business in California or handle anybody who their business who's a California resident. So if you think about the 40 million individuals who are in California, they have a wide reach. They're using, um, uh, you know, they're flying on airplanes. So Southwest Airlines has to comply with this, even if a California uh, individual is, uh, is flying between New York and Boston, the CCPA would apply. If you are a small business in St. Louis, Missouri, or in Southern Illinois, and uh, you have any uh, touch or reach to California or any of its residents, then the CCPA applies. And basically what it states is, is that you are going to protect, you're gonna take very strong procedures to protect their privacy, but you are also going to enable a California resident or California business to know if you're collecting their data. And so what you're seeing now is uh, almost in, in everything that you'll see online is, is this site uses cookies. And, um, and what that is, is it's, it's a means of complying with the CCPA. It's a way of businesses telling you that they're collecting information on you. So we know that when we go to a website and it's free, it's actually, um, when you think about it, it's, it's not actually free. What is happening is a business is collecting in a non-monetary way. So we, we may not uh, pay for Facebook, we may not pay for to use Google. What is happening is we are paying through our information and we are paying through our data. And under the CCPA, they now have to let us know that they are, are, they are doing that. So there has become a great deal more transparency in, uh, under this law. And uh, the law is, uh, it's, it's becoming a framework for other laws in other states. And so it is a, uh, it's a real important step in cyber regulation in the area of data privacy and, and data protection. So while the federal legislation is kind of more on the computer systems and networks, the CCPA is more about our privacy and our data. And so it is a, uh, it's a very important piece of legislation. And uh, within the law, there is uh, protections for net neutrality. Uh, that was a uh, political issue a number of years ago, which uh, is constantly being uh, challenged um, at the federal level, but it basically says that there has to be some fairness in the bandwidth that is afforded various uh, organizations, people, voices, and opinions. So another law, which is uh, new to California, is called the California IOT Cybersecurity Law. As probably you, some of you know, IOT is a, an acronym for the Internet of Things. I'm not a big fan of it, uh, that, that acronym, but uh, you, know, you can't fight City Hall, so I use it myself. And essentially what that is, is IOT are our devices. And so what this new law, which went into effect uh, January 1st, is basically a law that requires anyone who creates internet capable devices, such as smartphones, to have reasonable security features designed to protect user privacy. So if you buy the new Apple 12, iPhone 12, what you're gonna get is a device that is very different than if you had purchased, we'll say the, the iPhone uh, 8, which uh, I'm embarrassed to say uh, I use on, on occasion. It's, uh, my kids look at my phone and they just, they just laugh at me and say, Dad, how could you be so ancient to use uh, you know, an old phone? And why I respond to them is, I don't have a, a dad who pays for things for me. So I've got to use the old, old phones. I got to afford your, your new stuff. But the new stuff is uh, protecting their, their data and their privacy, whereas mine is not. So this is, a, uh, is an interesting law. It's kind of a, a regulatory law that's designed for the uh, information technology uh, industry, primarily the manufacturers that do business uh, in California, which is gonna be every, every company. And so it protects our smart devices, which are commonly known as IoT. All right, the New York Cybersecurity uh, 
requirements for financial service companies. This is uh, another law, which essentially is very similar to the California law, which basically says if you're going to handle people's money, you've got to protect that information. And so this has uh, become a, an important law, but it has a provision which is, uh, has become kind of a little bit onerous, but I think is a provision which will become the, the mainstay of all uh, cyber protection laws, and that is a 72-hour reporting requirement. So there was a time uh, prior to this law where in the event that your network was breached and someone had got access to your client information or client data or PII or PHI, you could take your time in uh, finding out what happened. You could uh, repair your network. You could uh, go to the cloud and replace all your data. You could basically get up and running. And then at some point you could call your clients and say, hey, by the way, someone may have stolen uh, some of your information, but don't worry. You know, uh, I don't think it's a big deal. Now there is a 72 hour time limit for you to identify an incursion on your, your network. And so this law has become a kind of a, a basis for future laws. So if you're looking to identify trends, and, and I don't think this talk is, is about memorizing these laws, it's about looking at what are the major trends. And so think about the CCPA as a trend towards increased privacy protection and the New York Cybersecurity Financial Service Companies Act as a means by which requires almost immediate reporting of a DDoS or a malware or ransomware that may affect any of uh, any individual's uh, privacy. In Illinois, there's uh, numerous laws. Missouri has a numerous laws that are uh, a little bit antiquated, <clears throat> but my thought is that they will uh, they will catch up, and uh, they will do so kind of mimicking what happens in California and in New York. So expect uh, Missouri and Illinois to kind of follow the model of the California and New York uh, legislation. And then I wanted to talk about one form of uh, foreign, uh, one international regulation, which is the General Data Protection Regulation called the GDPR. And that is for the European Common Union. So there are 28 countries that occupy or comprise of the, uh, as member states of the European Common Union. And they have agreed to a regulation called the GDPR, which is very similar to the California CCPA and also the New York legislation. And what it says is that if you do business in California or you do business with anyone, I'm sorry, do business in, in the European Common Union or do business with anyone from uh, the European Union, then you have to follow the GDPR. And so what's happening in the United States is, is that businesses in St. Louis are creating a GDPR standard for data protection and reporting. And so again, they utilize what was utilized in New York, and that is that 72 hour uh, response time to identify any incursion on a, a network. <clears throat> so you can see this, this trend that the federal government is kind of protecting your hardware and your systems, and the state is kind of, is, is looking more towards protecting your data privacy and uh, requiring you to respond in a, in a certain period of time. Right now it's 72 hours. The regulatory bodies that are involved in cyber uh, cybersecurity, I'll go through those relatively quickly, but uh, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission is, uh, is very important. The FBI is kind of the, uh, the organization that uh, prosecutes a lot of the crimes. Department of Homeland Security, we talked about earlier, they're involved with CISA. Department of Energy is with uh, critical infrastructure for nuclear power or any of our, our grids for the electric uh, energy industry. Department of Transportation, through the FAA, essentially protecting our, our, our towers that are organizing the flights that are coming in and out of uh, Lambert Field or at, uh, their, at Scott Air Force Base. So the FAA has a, a lot of cyber protections now. The SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission, is protecting our, our financial markets uh, through cybersecurity. And uh, in Illinois and Missouri, you have the Office of Cybersecurity, which is kind of a clearinghouse and uh, an educational resource for companies are interested in complying with cybersecurity regulations. So those are kind of uh, the big, uh, big muscle movements, I would say, for cybersecurity law. Again, that's kind of an, a, a look at what is the difference between state and federal, federal regulation. All right, I'm gonna to try to move quickly to private sector and government agencies. 
And, and what I'll say there is, is that there are certain laws, as I had stated, that um, limit government authority for, for cyber operations. And then there are laws that apply, apply to the uh, non-governmental agencies or the private sector. And then finally, and this is the area I want to spend the last few minutes, and that is the privacy protections versus breach responsibility. And we kind of talked about that a little bit earlier in the CCPA and the uh, GDPR uh, from the European Union, as well as the New York reg uh, legislation. But essentially what that, the way I look at uh, as a consultant in the cyber industry is I tell people that there are, you've got cyber hygiene requirements as well as cyber incident response. So if you think about those two areas, those are kind of the major thrusts of, of legislation. So what are the cyber hygiene? The cyber hygiene is, is kind of things that, you know, that we use on, on a daily basis. So I think probably daily, I get some email from what appears to be my bank or PayPal or Venmo or somebody telling me that there's been an incident or an issue with my account. Please click on this message and all my problems will be solved. Uh, a raise of hand, how many of you on a daily basis get a similar phishing email that tries to get us to click on something that will probably make our lives fairly miserable. And so that's a, uh, yes, Robert, are you raising your hand or you have a question? I, I am raising, but I just wanted to point out something. Usually they're for banks I have no business with. I, I think you cut out just a, a little bit. Uh, you want to say that again? Usually, they, I usually get those kind of notices from, you know, from uh, fishers who basically want of all things information from banks I don't do any business with. Yes, well, and, and that's fortunate because then you wouldn't click on, you know, that. But I use PayPal. You know, my clients pay me on PayPal. And yeah. Like I said, on virtually a daily basis, PayPal through some, you know, some crazy uh, domain name is emailing me, telling me there's a problem with my PayPal account. And so the uh, cyber hygiene are some of the practices that we use on, on, on a daily basis. And, uh, you know, I can run through the list, but I think most of us know that uh, dual authentication is important. Password security is important. Um, you know, for me, I have a, a CAT card, which is my military identification card. You know, I keep it in my computer. When I use it, when I go to the restroom, I pull that out and, uh, you know, take it with me so somebody can't access my computer. You know, I don't leave my computer open. I, you know, I trust my children, <coughs> but that doesn't mean that one of the kids won't get on my computer and, and go to a porn site or, or do something that I don't want on my computer. And so, you know, you've got to, good cyber hygiene is, is really important. And so there are, the legislation is now starting to mandate that cyber hygiene. And if you have a business, there's quite a bit of it to protect both PII, which is personal identification, identifiable information, as well as PHI, the personal health information. And so if you deal with anybody's money, or their social security numbers, or their financial information, or in my case, as an attorney, I, I deal with their legal information, then uh, there is a certain stricter regulations which require me to protect that data as, as well as uh, you know, through my network or my computers. And so that's kind of the, uh, the hygiene aspect. The second area is, um, is the recording, uh, re reporting requirements. So as an individual, if somebody breaks into your computer, you're not required right now, and I say right now, to report it to the United States government. So you don't have to call the FBI, you don't have to go through IC3, which is kind of the uh, a reporting agency. You don't have to uh, call the FBI, you don't have to call your uh, local, um, you know, St. Louis uh, County uh, Sheriff's Department and say, hey, my, uh, my network's been breached. You, you don't have to do that, there's no obligation. But if you have a business and you're in certain industries or if you have any information from clients or you have any public information that, that you resides on your network or your computer, then there is a reporting requirement. And that's where the CCPA and the uh, New York re legislation comes into play because it says that if something happens on your networks that could potentially be negative to anyone else's information that you're required to report that. And uh, the, air, the place that you wanna do that is called an ISAC, which is the information sharing and analysis centers. These are uh, kind of designed between a, a consortium of the FBI, DHS, uh, IC3, and, um, and CISA. And these are going to be, it's kind of a, 
you know, you, you'll see anytime you, you drive by a, uh, um, a firehouse, you see those signs that say safe place. And so we all know now that if somehow a baby comes into your hands and you can't take care of that baby and you're going to do something harmful, you take it to the, uh, the safe place. You take it to the, uh, the firehouse and that's a place you can take this, this child before you do something stupid. And it'll be the same way. These uh, ISACs will be publicized as places for you to report cyber incursion or phishing or malware or ransomware. And it will essentially enable the US government through a number of agencies to gather this information and combat malicious actors. And so ISACs are going to become more and more prevalent and common in, uh, in our lives. My thought is that we'll probably have a, an icon on our computers. If you buy a new computer or it'll be on your smartphone that you press this cyber you know, 911 to report some malicious uh, activity by uh, an actor or a uh, internal actor, an external or an internal actor. So these, uh, this is kind of some of the, the, the broad spectrum of, of cyber regulations. I know I, I really flew through this quickly. Um, you know, this, uh, I could spend hours doing this. I'd bore you all to death, but uh, this is kind of an overview of cyber regulations as it pertains to small and mid-sized businesses and us as individuals. So Elizabeth, uh, should I take some questions now or? Uh... Yeah, if anyone has anything, um, feel free to just shout it out. Oh, oh my, I, I got a list. I mean, we might have to <laughs> compare notes offline. Part, part of why I was eating up everything you were saying is I'm uh, doing uh, lecturing on this next week, just a, just a high level overview of the legal and regulatory environment, uh, both in the US and around the world, which is very difficult to do in a, uh, in an hour as, as, as you just demonstrated it, but you, you did a great job of hitting all the all the biggies, uh, for sure. I, I don't even know where to start with my questions. Maybe if somebody else has a, a quick one they want to do first before I, I don't want to monopolize the conversation, but. And Tim, I'll, I'll email you my notes. Okay. And, uh, so that'll provide you a good basis. And, and I think, I think I'm going to email you my slide deck that I'll be giving next week and you can maybe proof it and tell me if I've got anything seriously <laughs> in error there. All right. Um, part of, uh, part of my lack of comfort comfort with this area uh, when I'm teaching anything around cybersecurity is that the the laws are changing so quickly That's it's right. hard to keep up and and actually the only way I keep up is by networking with with people around town because uh, somebody said oh do you do you tell your class about the the cloud act of 2018 wait what was that and do you do you talk about the cybersecurity information sharing you know or IoT uh, sharing act of 2019 wait what what's that and i have to go read the wiki right. and you know brief myself um and then once you get into all the differences between all the states i mean not even between all the countries but just between all the all the states um i don't know how you keep from pulling all your hair out trying to keep up with all of it i i do tell students that you know, California is the most stringent in terms of privacy, and companies are tending to model all of their uh, internal policies to be compliant with CCPA. Um, but just try, trying to keep up, I've got an entire slide that says, "Make a lawyer your best friend" as soon as you start a, in your role in in cybersecurity. So, um, that, I think that still holds true that you need an expert like like you to guide every company because i don't understand how a business manager keeps up with all the changes do you have any advice around just keeping up to date yeah well you know certainly i you know i after i got off active duty i, I started a new company called nine line cyber elizabeth hope, hopefully you don't mind me plugging that just for a moment but uh it's a cyber uh consulting firm it's it's the number nine line cyber and if you go to my website uh you'll see you know, some of the things that, uh, that I do, but essentially, uh, you're right. Uh, you know, I tell people that, uh, you know, you, if you're in business now and you're using a computer and you're using networks, you need to acclimate yourself the idea that the computer can be a means by which you can lose your business, that you could right. actually put yourself in a position that your business will go away 
through lawsuits. Right. And so these regulations are now creating provisions that enable people to sue you. And so, you know, um, I tell people, you walk up to somebody on the street, you punch them, you not only go to jail, but they can sue you for punching them. And it's the same with cyber crimes. Up mm. until recently, if you violated a cyber crime, you could go to jail, but you couldn't be sued. Now you can be sued. And there's these provisions that enable uh, attorneys who are sitting on the sidelines who are just waiting to sue individuals who violate these laws. And people don't even know these laws exist. And you can do all the right things for all, you know, all the right reasons and expose yourself. And, and you're right, Tim. What's scary is, is that if you miss one week of, of reading updates, then you are, you're ancient. And so what I do is I've joined an organization called InfraGuard. And InfraGuard oh, sure. is yeah. a, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it, it's run by the FBI and they have a mm -hmm. partnership. But uh, there are, and CISA will send you emails on new legislation and things that are being considered. So you, you kind of just have, it's hard to be a part-time cyber individual uh, to be a, mm. you know, in this realm because things are just changing on a daily basis. You know, I, I do contract law for, you know, for 25 years. I don't really need to read anything new about contract law. It's, it's been around for several hundred years and it just doesn't change that much. Mm. And so I feel comfortable taking a year off and not worrying that I've missed something in, in contract law. You know, if you break a contract, it's called a breach. Not a lot has changed. But in the cyber realm, you, you, you go on vacation for two weeks and you come back. And, and Tim, you and I joked about this. I will get one of my kids and my students to raise their hand and ask me about a regulation that I'll have no idea. And I feel like a complete idiot. And I just discredited myself in front of everyone in my class. So it's, it's a tough realm to, uh, to call yourself an expert in. And, and I, therefore, I don't. I just tell people that I'm a consultant and, uh, mm. and tell them that I have expertise, but I'm not an expert because uh, I take two-week vacations. And when I do, I try to avoid you know, reading on anything. So it, it's tough. You just have to yeah. – the good news is, is that if you know half of the things I talked about, you're probably an expert. So <laughs> as long as everyone else is dumb, then we're kind of smart. Yeah, it's more like knowing just enough to be dangerous. But uh, That's exactly you, you right. had a lot of great – a lot of great uh, – tips and you you helped you helped me put a lot of pieces together in my head it was it was good um can, can i ask you a gdpr question sure the, this is really uh, nitpicky but the one of the well the fine for uh a data breach for gdpr is four percent of your revenue per record is that right like as well, in the, each row of a spreadsheet per record? Yeah, so I will tell you that, that the GDPR has not been tested in court. Yeah. So I have friends who uh, operate in Europe, and, I've, and I asked them, has anyone been tried yet? And have there been fines? And from what I'm being told is we're kind of in this, uh, this period in which there's not a lot of enforcement. What you're okay. given is this uh, remediation period. So they're giving you between seven and 14 days to essentially remediate. Uh, so if you've got a bad practice and you're, you're brought up as a, uh, someone who has uh, violated either the basis of the law or some of its provisions, you're afforded the opportunity to kind of self-correct. Okay, okay. As opposed to these massive fines. Because essentially what would happen is, is that businesses would be going out of business just on right. a daily basis. Right. It'd be an extinction level event for sure. That's, That's exactly right. But the danger is, is like what's happening in California and New York and through the GDPR is, is that these regulations are essentially have the potential to stop your business or to stop your agency um, from operating the next day. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like what we saw with the, uh, you know, the, the COVID and mask, that if you didn't follow the Department of Health regulations, they just put chains on your doors. Mm. And it's the same thing in the cyber realm. You can't imagine being an accountant that has one European client and all of a sudden you get an email from, um, you know, from Brussels being told you can't operate anymore. And you say, hey, I'm an American citizen. Right. I don't care what <laughs> right. you do. <laughs> right. And then they say, yeah, but believe it or not, the state of Missouri has a reciprocal agreement, which we can actually close your business. Well, I mean, these things are all potentially happening. Yeah. So, you know, what I tell people, my young lawyers that I teach 
is that cyber realm is an area that you, you've got to know at least some basics about because your clients are going to be breaking these rules on a daily basis without even knowing that they do it. Right, right. So if, if GDPR went into effect in 2018, you're saying it's just now starting to hit litigation and the courts and we're still waiting right. on kind That's of results. That's exactly right. And, okay. and, and I'll be honest, I don't, I don't read the European law journals, uh, so I, I don't track the, the cases. But what I do uh, do on a, you know, a fairly regular basis is I go on, on YouTube and I, I see the European lawyers that are now advertising their services for GDPR. Mm. And uh, I watched one yesterday. Uh, the guy was a British law firm. Uh, even though, um, you know, he says that the law is out there and it's being implemented, that he didn't believe that there has been uh, punitive measures that have been taken against companies as of yet. So wow. there is this okay. lag time. Okay. But, you know, uh, again, that doesn't mean that they're not getting these letters saying, hey, you do this or, you know, we could shut you down. So it's. Uh, yeah, but I'll bet once that first one happens, the floodgates. That's exactly right. And as we know, governments love, uh, you know, they love money coming in. And if this is a way of punishing a big tech giant in the United States for violation of this law, then, you yeah. know, why wouldn't they do it? Yeah. Good stuff. This is great. I don't know about anybody else, but this helps me with my job. But and well, uh, Infragard is certainly a great recommendation. All right, Obsidian, did you have uh, any thoughts or questions? Um, I didn't have any questions. I thought it was really interesting, though. I really enjoyed your presentation, um, and thank you for sharing that information. I really enjoyed it a lot. My pleasure, uh, Anthony. Uh, how about yourself? Do you have any? Uh, thoughts or questions? Uh, no, it's very informative. Um, I do have a quick question. We, I work for a company that deals with high frequency trading uh, market data and we're more of a vendor to Wall Street. Um, there's no regulations, there's no framework for us. Do you have a suggestion um, that we can explore as far as, you know, NIST or something along those lines where we're not required to actually be compliant with anything, but we, we, you know, we should be. Yeah. So you've hit upon it. NIST is a great framework because for the, at least in your case, it sounds like it's not dispository. In other words, it's, it's not required for you to act, but it's giving you some really good guidance as a, as a framework of what you should and shouldn't do. Okay. Um, so you know, the federal regulate, I'm sorry, the New York regulation uh, that I mentioned, it, it may or may not apply to you. Um, you know, I, I don't know enough about your business, you know, to advise you, but you also may want to look at complying with that um, simply because those are really good best practices. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Travis, I'm just going around the other uh, room. Did you uh, have anything, uh, any questions or suggestions or thoughts? Uh, no, sir. Um, I didn't. I had to step away for a work call, but um, it was a great presentation. I, I really enjoyed it. And um, I, uh, I also am out at the base, so we may see each other around out there. All right. Sounds good. All right, Elizabeth. Well, um, oh, Robert, I'm sorry I didn't, uh, didn't hit you. All right. All right. Well, Elizabeth, uh, barring any uh, questions from you, I, I guess we'll, uh, we'll sign off. Uh, just real quick, Elizabeth. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. This is Nick. Um, appreciate the uh, the information that you you gave to us, Justin. Uh, is there? I'm sure I can get your information from Elizabeth, but I did have a couple questions specific to some of the compliance frameworks that you you had mentioned. Um, would you be open to a quick, you know, chat or a phone call, maybe in the next few days or a couple weeks? Yes, of course. Okay. Again, appreciate it. Thank you for, for all the information, it was great. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't, Nate or Shannon or, or Andrew, or, uh, I apologize, I didn't, because I didn't see your photo, I, I guess I didn't think. But anyway, if you have any questions. Yeah, uh, so you had mentioned that you have your uh, slideshow that you'd be willing to share. Is there somewhere we can uh, be able to acquire that or? So I think the easiest thing for me to do, uh, Elizabeth, if you're okay is, uh, as uh, I can email to her, it, it's really just a, uh, a, I call it a white paper. Uh, it's not necessarily a, sh a slideshow. Right. Uh, it's just the notes that I, I read off of. Uh, 
you're, you're welcome to send me an email. I'll, I'll be happy to send, you know, give you all. I think it's probably easiest. I'll just give you my email. So it's uh, Justin at PerrymanLaw.com. So Justin at PerrymanLaw.com, spelled P-E-R-R-Y-M-A-N-L-A-W.com. And if you want to shoot me an email, I'll be happy to send you just uh, my notes and you're welcome to utilize them as you wish. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Awesome. And if anybody asks me for a recommendation on legal consulting, I'll refer them to you. That'd be wonderful, Tim. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Elizabeth, do you have any housekeeping? Uh... Um, I guess quick last call. Any questions, anything, any last minute thoughts anyone else has before we wrap up? When, when is the next, me next meeting? So it's the first Tuesday of every month, um, uh, barring I find a speaker. Um, it should be next Tuesday, March the 2nd. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so thank you again, Justin. That was a really good, really informative presentation. And yeah, I, I post the notes um, after every meetup. Um, I post them on the meetup site and this uh, video is also recorded. So I'll put that up and, and you can kind of rewatch parts, whatever you need um, for a recap. And then, yeah, Justin, if you want to send me over your notes and I can put those up on the page as well once I publish that. All right, very well. Mm -hmm. All right then, thanks everybody. Thank you. Yeah, if uh, everyone's good we can go ahead and wrap this up thank you justin and thanks everyone for joining us tonight yeah thank you for your time justin all right bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.